how does giving and receiving compassion help a person become more resilient? Right. Well, um, so again, when we give compassion, one of the things it does for ourselves as well as the other person is increase the sense of connectedness. We know as human beings that feeling isolated, feeling alone, feeling cut off from the social group is actually one of the most damaging states we can be in. It goes to our very you know, evolutionary uh, soul that we will not survive if we are alone. And so when we give compassion or when we receive compassion, the sense of connectedness, the sense, a sense of being integrated with other humans gives us a sense of stability and strength. So it's funny because, it, you know, we talk about it as the individual gives or receives compassion, but really it is this sense of connectedness that I feel is actually one of the most powerful gifts of compassion. You know, when we aren't alone, we can achieve much more than we're, when, when, are, you know, when we are alone, that's for sure. What are the benefits of self-compassion? And in particular, how does self-compassion make people stronger rather than weaker? Yeah, it's, it's so funny. One of the biggest misconceptions about self-compassion is that it's a weakness. You know, you're going to lose your edge. It's going to make you soft. Um, in fact, we know from the research that self-compassion is one of the most powerful sources of coping and resilience we have um, available to us. It helps people cope with cancer. It helps people um, cope with divorce. Uh, just to give an example of one study, we measured the self-compassion levels of vets coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. We also measured the level of combat exposure. And their level of self-compassion predicted whether or not they develop PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome a year later, more powerfully than how much combat exposure they had. And right? when you say predicted as a researcher, you mean... I mean, so in other words, more self-compassion meant less, less likely to get PTSD. Yeah. You know, even, and this is even more so than the than, than level of how much action you saw as a predictor. So, and really, I think it's, I like that analogy because if you think of the battle analogy and, you know, let's face it, life is a battle. Some of us go to actual battle, but others have little battles with our spouse at the grocery store, right? Yeah. So basically, when you go into battle, do you want an ally at your side or an enemy at your side? Most of us are actually inner enemies. We cut ourselves down. We're, we feel ourselves with shame. We say we're unworthy. That was so stupid. I can't believe you did that. We, you know, we're really, we're often harsher with ourselves than we are to anyone else. And, and all, even people we don't like very much, we often don't say the types of things to them that we say to ourselves. But if you have an inner ally at your side, in other words, a voice in your head is saying, hey, you know, it's okay. Yeah, you made a mistake, but it's only human. I got your back. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the constructive steps we need to take to make a change. When you've got a friend to support, like a really good coach who cares about you, wanting you to reach your full potential, which is what self-compassion is, right? We care about ourselves. We want to alleviate our suffering. We want to reach our full potential. Having an ally, an inner ally, is going to be a, a, give you strength that you wouldn't have had if you're cutting yourself down all the time. And again, there's lots of research at this point to, to back up what I'm saying.